Well, I'm pretty sure I'm solo tonight. Um, Kevin didn't have a chance to read the book, and I think John is kind of pivoting to focusing on other stuff outside of the NBA with his free time. So um, I decided I'm going to keep doing this. I'm not exactly sure if I'm going to keep doing the podcast part, but I'm definitely going to keep reading the books. And um, I might as well start because I want to try and get through this pretty quick. Um, so the book that we or that I read this time around was uh, Why the Best or the Best by Kevin Eastman. And it is um uh a book by kevin eastman was an assistant coach for doc uh in the nba for the clippers and for boston um and then it sounds like he went on to become like a motivational speaker of sorts uh and so the book is like he he basically, I mean, it says on here, 25 powerful words that impact, inspire, def and define champions. So he talks a lot about, like, the power of words. He defines words um, and the power of lists as well and how you can use them to help you, you know, motivate you, help you overcome obstacles. He talks about overcoming like the overwhelm. So it's it's applicable to like real normal life as well. He does use some examples in it that I think are potentially a little outdated. Like he uses a lot of sort of like captains of industry touchstone examples as far as like leadership and, and what great leadership is, which to me, some of those are not as relevant post pandemic um, just because I think We've learned that like kind of going along with the, this idea of like, you know, not all billionaires are smarter than everybody else kind of thing. Um, so, but um, I, I'm going to try and go through it fairly quick. Like I said, I, the things that really stood out to me, I mean, I found some of it a little like motivational speakery, like, and which he is, um, so that totally makes sense. I guess like as a person who's the caretaker full time and, um, it, you know, who's like my entire job part, well, the, you know, aside from just like the absolute day to day is like, I've been taking care of my son and my husband's been, you know, pretty much out of commission as far as like daily chores. So it was a little, it's a little tongue in cheek to like read something like this about being the best of the best. And it's like, fuck, I can't even get through the dishes. You know what I mean? But anyways, um, having said that, um, like, I think he was useful and he did have some relevant examples. And, um, so he has, I have a list of the 25 power words in here and a page or two. Uh, which are really interesting. And some of them I think were more relevant for me. At one point in the book, he says that you should choose your own power words, you know, and use whatever is going to be the most relevant to you and the most like personal um, and is obviously going to be the most effective. Um, and then he talks about, he just sort of introduced himself by talking about his mom's suicide and um, I thought that was interesting and relatable. And also having just read The Blood in the Garden with um, Pat Riley's history of him sort of, I guess, like following this plan, essentially of being the best of the best, because he was kind of scared of becoming his father and having this like post-career depression. So to stave it off, he sort of like, you know, implemented this massive like regimen of habit and, um, and, you know, and work ethic and to kind of like batten down the hatches against it. So he talks about that in that sense, but also that he had this blended family that was really big. So he was sort of lonely in a crowd a lot of the time. And then he found basketball, which became his, his passion. And and helped him find something outside of himself that, you know, um, 
that took away some of the loneliness and some of the fear and some of the anxiety uh, and that made him feel a part of something and and made him think that he could understand something enough to be good at it um, and then he talks about the try and and that's just he he just said you you have to be willing to try and you know so many times like which I really felt this one, but you you can really overthink things, you know, and and not even start that first part of of the try, which is just give it a chance, see if you can do it. Um, he talks a lot about overcoming failure in here and about how failure is, you know, a part of success and stuff like that, and and I thought that was really really relevant. Um, and then about his journey uh from being the, like an assistant coach and um and the year that he was with the boston celtics when they won the championship talks about some of the players involved in that who he thinks are the best or the best he uh i would say the standout players that he talks about are kevin garnett he does talk about kobe a little bit and there's a third one in there somewhere that i will probably come up later hopefully um Talks about believing in yourself, uh, maximizing time through words and lists, um, having a growth mindset, and then being your best. Um, and then he he does all these cool like triangles of like, you know, well, I have them in here so we can look at them, but it'll, it, I guess it's a little harder to understand them audibly, but um you know, of these things that go hand in hand in hand, like the one that really stands out to me is the one where he has like a likability factor in with other elements of success and, um, and does a really good job about talking about how, even though you can say like, oh, it doesn't matter if people like you, you know, who cares if that you just have to work with them kind of thing. But he, he, he makes the case that it's actually really, um, relevant if people like you because that's how you're going to get ahead right that's how you're going to get more opportunities that's how you're going to uh, become better and better and better that's how you're going to have the best teammates and all of those kind of things so i thought that was really good i'll get into it a little bit more specifically in a minute here um so the standout words out of his list for me were trust truth accountability sacrifice and commitment and i was reading this primarily through the lens of sacramento kings um so uh you know take what you will from that i mean where the sacramento kings are right now is i would say that the fan even though we're at the same exact same record we were last year which was like the first successful year for them the fan base, I think, is feeling very unsettled that it's not more cohesive, that they're not more dominant, that they don't see a you know, ton of growth in what the Kings have done from last year to this year. Um, and in fact, like some of the metrics that they're that that were so fantastic last year, like being the number one offense in the in the history of the NBA, is no longer true, right? They've gone away from some of the stuff that was was um, really successful for them. And then I would say the trust. He says some stuff about trust in here that really, uh, you know, really uh, inspired new thinking in in my mindset of like what a team is and what teamwork is and how that kind of trust is a is a two-way street um so uh i'm not sure if i pulled any quotes on it and and he does define trust in this list too but he gives an example of like having a teammate who at the beginning of the year you know he's saying simplification is kind of like the bulwark of a lot of these things is like a coach going to the player and saying, this is what I need from you, this, this, and this, making it extremely simple. And then a player being like, I can do this, this, I can deliver, or I can't deliver or whatever it is. And a part of trust is like hearing hard truths and understanding hard truths, right. And incorporating them into 
how you are going to become the best of the best for yourself, right? Um, so being able to take criticism in a way that's constructive rather than reactive um, is a part of like that trust truth, um, you know, paradigm. And then the accountability works into that as well. Like, um, you know, you holding your teammates accountable, your teammates holding the coaches accountable, the co et cetera. It goes all, you know, all the way up and down the entire organization. Um, and these things are, I obviously, I think these are universal kind of, uh, you know, in a workplace, in a family. And you, you would like to think that all of your relationships are marked by trust, truth, accountability, um, sacrifice and commitment, right? And there's other words that, again, like on the next page, I think I have the list and the definitions. So some of them, you know, touched me. Like I, I've been having some problems with like, I wouldn't necessarily call it totally procrastination, but like putting stuff off and then kind of spacing it out, you know, and not making the time to be proactive about doing that. So he talks about he talks about time management, prioritizing um, tasks, you know, and get and, and using your free time in a, in a maximized sort of way and doing the unrequired work. Um, and um, yeah, so that is that's the main chunk of the book, in my in my opinion. And then the champion's compass, he talks about pushing through hard stuff pushing through, you know, um, moving on from bad things, like incorporating them into your habits and your routine to address them, but also being able to like move on. And I think it's relevant in the sense of like, you know, like the, again, going back to the Kings play of late, the last like five games, they've had these moments in the game where they just, they really, you can see them lose focus and it can be, uh, because they're distracted by what's happening with the referees at, at times, or it can be that they literally like cannot hold on to the ball, but they don't slow the game down or take timeouts or have any reactivity to it. And so the focus goes and they are unable to regain it. So I think that's a type of moving on in the moment that is um, really important. But then in, as far as like a longer timeline of moving on is being able to, you know, use losses and use failure as, as opportunities for growth rather than as sour grapes, essentially. Um, and it, again, overcoming failure goes hand in hand with that, right? So like, what, what do you see that you can change from that failure? How can you turn that failure into success? Um, and then he talks about getting better and he talks, he has like a bunch of triangles on, on like what the different, you know, sort of avenues uh, that he believes are the best to go down in terms of getting better. Um, and then uh, like at these triangles, the, the success triangles, um, the power thoughts of champions. So like some of them is it, one of them's all in, give in or not in. I think like, again, I think Kings fans would recognize that from, you know, Mike's, Mike's whole thing is like having this all in mindset. And if you're not all in, you're not in. And uh, the given part is, you know, are you, can you withhold and push through um, to, to remain all in? Um, and then he has the three gaps. Uh, the respect, like, and trust, which I kind of touched on. So, so that was the main one of the three gaps. I think there's actually more gaps, but the respect, like, and trust, I thought was really interesting because we already talked, we already know he talks a lot about truth. The truth is, is to me the most important theme throughout this whole book. And trust obviously goes hand, hand in hand with truth, right? So you respect somebody and respect, I think is pretty straightforward. You trust them, but liking them is also extremely important, especially in a team setting. Um, and you, 
you get like through trust and respect, right? Uh, so here's this list, truth, action, intentional, preparation, accountability, trust, sacrifice, discipline, commitment, belief, unrequired, um, choices, circles. That, this is an interesting one, the circles. Um, competition, passion, habits, urgency, standards, courage, curiosity, respect, adjustment, humility, investment, and talent. Um, so I guess maybe, I, let me see what I did here today. Yeah, I maybe didn't. Oh, no, here it is. Yeah. So let me do this actually now. So so truth, the ultimate must have for personal and team success. Without it, we'll live in the world of frustration and regret. Action. The only way to get there is to start now. Intentional. Uh, intentional. What I do on purpose to fulfill my purpose. Preparation. I have to be there before I get there accountability, my word to the team that I will understand, execute, and hold myself to all, um, to all I must do to contribute to the successful completion of our goal, trust, the glue that holds the connection together in order to succeed, sacrifice, giving up something that may be best for you, but not best for the team, discipline, the focused mindset that gets me past mad, sad, and hard, uh, commitment, uh, the strength of my word, the back of my teammate, and the best interest of my team in mind at all times. Belief, the power created inside of me from the work, thought, research, and preparation I put in behind it. Um, unrequired, the work that others don't see, don't think about, and won't do that I must make a priority. Choices, if I listen to the right voices, I tend to make the right choices circles, the people I allow in to impact my future and the person I become, competition, a given, if I am pursuing greatness, something I must be prepared for and willing to do every day, passion, that pull inside of me that comes from the love I have for something, the emotion that pushes me past the impossible, habits, the good ones are the most powerful and most needed. Uh, let's see here. slow going. Uh, are the most, so habits are, they're the most uh, hard to create and difficult to break. Urgency now wins more often than tomorrow. Standards, the level of expectation I put on myself, my teammates and the team. The measurement for filling my capacity, oh, capability gap, courage, the strength that comes from knowing I have done all I can to take that unknown or uncomfortable step, curiosity, knowing that I don't know what I need in order to get me to where I want to go. Um, so this was a lot of the curiosity when it was like about asking great questions, like how do you, you know, I mean, I guess like accepting people as leaders too, right? Other people, that other people are more um, knowledgeable than you. And to fill your knowledge gap, you, you know, asking lots of questions and understanding the, um, you know, the goal is, is paramount. Um, respect, giving it keeps me humble. Getting it requires earning it. Adjustment, darn it, ain't working. Uh, the different next step I must take to achieve my goal. So backup plan, um, you know, the ability to reevaluate and not just stew in something that it doesn't seem like it's going to, um, you know, you're not going to have a breakthrough at it. Humility. 
makes me open and available to keep learning. I don't know it all. Investment, all the big and little things I do now that may not reap a benefit today, but will add up to create the opportunity for uh, success tomorrow. Oh, uh, I don't know why, why it says me where I want to go. Respect giving it keeps me. Oh, I, I must have. Investment. And then he has, um, but it will create the opportunity. And then talent. He Talent is overrated unless we add an E and a D. In my world, the E and the D stand for extra dimension. Um, I carry them with me and within me. So, okay. So he has all these words that he, he has in a blue file in his briefcase. And he takes it out and studies it regularly. So he uses these concepts and words as like ongoing inspiration um, or to like get him back on track, right? If he feels like he's fallen off. Um, and um, so with that, that was really interesting. And he said, you know, he, everybody gets stuck. Everybody gets overwhelmed. Everybody has challenges. But, it, you know, if you have this kind of like uh, system and plan um, that you trust in and that you can refer to when you start getting off course, um, you know, then you can reset, right? Um, so these are all these triangles. So, so these, this one... I don't know that I can explain them perfectly at all, uh, but they were really interesting. So he had capability gap, knowledge gap, and teamness gap. So this was kind of like, how can you get where you want to get to? And he talks a lot about how the best of the best, like Kevin Garnett, um, again, specifically, or, you know, I he does talk about other players, but I, for some reason it's escaping me right now. But um he talks about how they have the humility to know that they don't know everything and that they're willing to take um, criticism and take hard truths and, and, and understand that they exist to help them, right? To close these gaps. So um, that one was pretty interesting. Um, and then learn from the past, produce in the present, prepare for the future. Um, and this was sort of the reset that I was talking about as far as like, these are the most important things that you can have is the skill set, your mindset, and then being able to reset, right? So your skill set is obviously extremely important and always adding to it through your the capability gap and the knowledge gap and the teamness gap. Um, but also your mindset. Oh, LeBron, he talks about LeBron. Um, he talks about like seeing LeBron at like, a, I think it was like a Nike, um, not a camp or anything, but where he just, he just went to a workout with LeBron and said some really hardcore things like, Hey, you don't do this well enough. This will be really difficult for you in the NBA. It was like pre NBA for LeBron. Right. And LeBron's reaction to it, instead of being like a spoiled brat or a prima donna or whatever it was like, thank you. I know I need to get better at those things. You know, I understand. Thank you for giving me stuff to work on. So that goes a lot to mindset, to humility, you know, to this kind of concept. Like he, he puts out there that the best of the best are always working to be better. Right. And that's why they form these incredible habits that support, um, their performance, right? Like, and he uses, um, I have it in here somewhere, the quote, the, the iceberg concept of like, you see 10% of the mass, right? And the other 90% is under the water. And for the best of the best, what's under the water is this preparation, habits, um, you know, practice, the unrequired work that they're doing, these this effort to close all these gaps um, and it doesn't stop, right? Especially while you're playing or while you're still working or, I mean, if you're trying to apply this kind of a thing to like your personal life, 
um, you're always trying to know, you know, understand more, know more, etc. And that does not, you don't let that stop. Um, and then he has, he had, let's say, three dimensions of success. I think this is learned from the past, produced in the present, three sets or the skill set mindset, the three C's. So these are, these are things that you don't want to do, right? You don't want to compromise. You don't want to be conceited and you don't want to be complacent because that stops all of the, your forward motion. So if you're a dick, basically, um, you know, or you're stuck up or you think you're better than everybody else and, and nobody can tell you how to be better, you won't, you won't get there. Um, and then the best, my best and our best, I can't specifically remember some of these I was like more into than others. So I kind of like faded on some of them, but I mean, I think this is pretty obvious that it's, it's merging you know, you're, you're trusting that your teammates are also trying to become their best. And then you're merging it all into a way that you're creating a team, right? And then this one, the, <clears throat> uh, let me see. So three, three bests. So that must be that one. And then three don'ts are like, this one is don't um, discount information or input or feedback. That's just because it's obvious, right? And he uses the example of the Warriors. Um, uh, I think it, it wasn't the ball boy, but it was one of like the, you know, deep assistant coaches who was super young and um, that I, I can't remember what exactly his position was, but he was the one that said, well, you should probably play Iguodala instead of, right? Um, and that was like a revelation in 2015 that, that you know, uh, propelled them to their 2015 uh, championship. But he said just as easily, like that coaching staff could have gone, well, duh, like, you know, and not incorporated it and not given it credence. He's not saying do everything that's obvious. He's just saying, don't just, you know, don't discount stuff because of the source. And the same with age. He says he's seen, you know, that a lot of stuff gets discounted um, because people are less, uh, less apt to give credence to, to like younger, you know, stuff that's too young or too old kind of concept, which, um, you know, he's saying just, just be aware of where ideas come from and, and be receptive to all of them. Right. Um, and even outlandish ones, I'm pretty sure the ideas part of the triangle is like, even if something sounds really outlandish, still process it, still listen, still hear it because there may be something in there that is functional, right. That, that is relevant, that, that does solve something. Um, and then of course I didn't. So the three ingredients, I think, um, so these are, this is sort of the overwhelm is this where you can get a, to that point of stopping yourself or quitting or not overcoming or, um, he, and he says a, a bunch of times you need to get past some of these things. So fear, obviously the and failure and I would say fear of failure and then limitation. Um, what does he call this one? The three battles. So you have to, you have to overcome those and fight against them. Um, and you know, you may break through and you may not on all of them. Um, but continuing to, to fight against them and recognize them for what they are is is useful and then three ingredients i don't know if that's this one oh respect trust and like so i already kind of talked about this one but the respect he's saying you have to earn earn respect um and part of that is by giving respect finding people that you respect having people that you respect you have to trust 
Um, and this goes again back to some of the other, like he talks about the circles one is really interesting where he talks about, especially for like famous athletes or, you know, LeBron, KG, whoever you have to have, don't just have yes men in your, in your circle, right? You have to have people who are going to tell you the truth. And that is the impetus of growth, right? So you, so you have to have trust, you have to give trust and you have to uh, embody trust as well as you have to be trustworthy. So you shouldn't like, for instance, make a goal that you could not possibly attain, right? Because that will break the trust that you have with your team, essentially. Um, and then like, it, I and again, like I, you know, I think it's easy to like, to sort of say like, oh, you don't have to like everyone you work with. Oh, it's, they don't have to like each other. You know, they just have to play together. But he, he really makes this case. And I think we can like, easily take like a, an example like Dwight Howard or uh, there was a more recent one that I was just thinking of the other day where you, they're just not super well liked in the NBA and therefore I think their accomplishments, their stats, their um, whatever it is get discounted a little bit. Sometimes some of that has to do with, uh, you know, them being more individually oriented than team oriented to. So like if, if, I don't know, you have all the stupid goat conversations and if someone's in the goat conversation without team accomplishments, it tends to get discounted or like with Wilt Chamberlain, he always was saying like, well, why does everybody like Bill better? Bill, you know, why does, why is Bill Russell like have more respect? Why does he get all the awards when my numbers are so much better? Because he had the team accomplishments, right? He understood sacrificing for the team um, rather than doing something like, and I'm not trying to bash Wilt at all, believe me. Um, but like Wilt, you know, was the assist leader one year because somebody said he couldn't do it. So did he do that, you know, to be the best teammate? No, he did it because somebody happen to criticize his individual stats, right? Or like, you need to take like Rondo on the Kings, that Kings team. The Kings team was absolutely wretched. Rondo had like one of his best years ever in assists. Um, I mean, partially because he knew that's how he would get paid, I think. Um, and I think he was trying to be a team player. I'm not saying he wasn't. But it's just, there's a difference, right, uh, between uh, being a part of a successful unit and being um, an individual and a star. Um, and then the all in given, not in given. Um, so he, this, again, goes to, like, trust and truth. And this all in is, like, is, like, when you're all in with your team and with your coaching staff and with your front office and you're willing to hear these truths and have trust and, and you're willing to give anything to complete, you know, the larger teamwork issue. Um, and, um, and then the three up, so the three ins, and then the three ups showing up, shutting up and keeping up. So, he just says like, sometimes, you know, he talks about shutting up as it just having, try to have a good attitude about it, right? Don't be, don't be a jerk. Like show up every day, do your best to like, leave it all on the floor, you know, put everything you can into it. Um, do this extra dimension of unrequired work. Um, do your best to keep up. And then also like, you know, shutting up is more about like, I think don't, you know, don't complain, essentially. Um, so the power of lists, um, I, so he talks a lot about having values and how you have to have values to point you towards what truth is, what trust is, what respect is. Um, 
and he he talks at the very end he's talk he talks about are you you know when you're when you're finished with your job are you leaving a job are you leaving a like legacy so these values and you know would be like what impact are you having on the people around you in terms of leadership in terms of of information in terms of preparation in terms of establishing habits like all of those things how can you um how can you impact the world around you in a positive way that leaves a legacy right um and he talks about overcoming the overwhelm which is like a oh, part of what he says which I, I thought was really interesting and i found valuable was was if you know we all kind of have this um tendency to uh say oh I, I i don't have time for that i don't have the time you know but he's saying well just you need you have to make the time you have to make these things a priority whatever it is like he uses the example of he reads for two hours a day so he reads something that will close that knowledge gap for him two hours a day right and um so did he start out having the time to do that? No, but that's a part. He, he also talks about building habits and how building habits is a ton of work, right? To begin with. And then once you have invested in building that habit, it's a habit and you can keep continuing to, to it, you know, going back to it. And it, it keeps being a part of, of your preparation. So I don't know, like, you know, there's all this like sort of, I mean, obviously this is not going to overcome in, in like basketball. It's not going to overcome you having zero talent or being five foot three or right. It's, it's, um, but it's, it's what you can add in to become better and become your best. Um, and whether it takes you to being the best of the best is, is kind of another, I think part of that is the talent factor. Um, I don't know what the inside the room part is. I can't totally remember that. Um, and the personal success plan is again, like he was talking about, you know, closing those gaps for himself, having these like regimented, um, uh, words and lists that he returns to that help get him back on track so that he can show up and shut up every day. Right. And, um, and he also talks in here about like working out and eating right and you know so bringing it to like a personal level but i think you can also see it in like a business model sense that you know you build goals and have team goals and all this kind of thing um and the champions are about i don't know what that is i don't know if i missed where he talks about oops I don't know if I missed where he talks about, um, he talks about sacrifice and how important it is um, to under, for, for, the, for the best of the best to understand um, how they can sacrifice to make their teams better, right? So it's kind of a similar kind of concept, I would say to like, uh, sorry, I'm screwing this up. Um, like thinking basketball, they have this whole thing about uh, Wilt Chamberlain being, you know, the main avenue, right? And you have five different streets on the floor, basically, uh, or you can think about it as like usage or whatever you want. So which one is the fastest and the best way to get to the arena, right? Or the win, or get to the end of the game with a win, right? Is it always Wilt Chamberlain or Bill Russell? Like no, because they're planning for that. And sometimes they're planning for that, you know, with two other people or with a blitz or with a trap or whatever it is like. And so, you know, he's saying for the best of the best to be truly their best, they have to understand where they're giving stuff up to their teammates. Maybe it's stuff their teammates can do better, or maybe it's stuff that it's more effective letting other people do it, right? So um, I thought was a pretty interesting one. Uh, 
I, I honestly, the champions are about part. I don't totally remember what specifics are in that one. Um, but it's all along the same kind of, uh, you know, theme. Uh, the power of a two-letter word. So no trust, no truth, no good choices, no quality circles to travel in. So he's just saying, like, think of how much it can change everything when you put no in front of anything, right? So it's just like those two tiny letters completely change everything about it. So, I mean, I think in a sense he's saying it's, sort, it's somewhat fragile, all this, right? Because this is all work that you're putting in. Um And then the power of your legacy, I kind of already said that, like what impact do you have on other people around you? And is it a job or a purpose? So like, are you working to make whatever it is better, your job, your family, your team, right? Are you um, sacrificing? Are you promoting? Are you trusting? Are you holding other people accountable? Um, you know, are you telling the truth? Are you being a good circle member to somebody else? Uh, and um, and then, he, you know, like he says, take take some of these words or like find your own. Um, and then, you know, hopefully use them to, to be the best of the best in your life. Right. So. Um, and then I just I just pulled some quotes, uh, not very many, I don't think. They were just my favorite, and I don't think they're in the right order or anything. But like I said, truth, trust, accountability, um, you know, having a, a truthful circle, um, not just yes men, um, and being able to be, you know, an adaptability, um, all of these things uh, are so important. But the one that stood out to me the most was truth. So truth, the ultimate must have for person. Oh, you know what? This is the wrong list because this isn't. Uh, this is what I already said. So let's see. So, okay, so he's talking about the words. I carry them with me and within me. If you were to look in my briefcase, you would find a blue folder. The folder is blue, not just because that's my favorite color, but so that I can find it instantly. Within it, you would find the list I still consult daily. I might be stopped at a traffic light and slip it out of the briefcase. So he's kind of saying, like, if there's something that's stuck and something that's bugging him, too, he'll go to, like, a certain concept or a certain word and kind of ruminate it and you know try and get unstuck that way um my experience as a coach has taught me that there is a value in taking complex things and breaking them down into simple understandable and memorable lessons einstein once said the definition of genius is taking the complex and making it simple i think that's really true i think like a lot of the analytics stuff that that we've looked at and, and read is like, um, I thought uh, Chasing Perfection did a really good job of talking about how it's like this massive concept at the top. And then how do you filter it down through various people until it actually gets to the people who have to enact it on the court, right? And um, so, I mean, to me, a big part of that is like identifying what's important and then um, condensing it into better, you know, telling somebody that, that you need five rebounds is a lot easier than saying, oh, hey, like your rebounding percentage is, you know, it, you know, 17% too low. We need you to get it up. Like um, just something totally stupid like that. Um, so, and then he talks a lot about preparation and forming habits. So the work that goes on behind success, the mindset that you can turn into a habit in order to succeed and the execution discipline you can acquire to arrive at success. Um, 
he talks about building habits. I thought the building habits part of the book was really good about how to like implement something and um, and that how how hard it is to to make it into a habit, right? And I mean, I don't know. I've read before that like it takes like six weeks to actually like make something into a habit, right? Or like I was trying to do like meal prep, right? You know, and it's like the first five were pretty easy. The second five I was like, oh, this is like a pain in the butt, you know? But you, if you can push past that, you get to a point where you just do it, right? It's just a part of when you get home from grocery shopping or whatever, you chop everything up and you have snacks and you have your dishes that you're going to make, etc. cetera. Um, that's probably a bad example. But so there's an irony in the word truth. While truth can sometimes can be something that is difficult to hear, it is also something that is critical to hear. We're probably all looking for one word and the complex concepts and beliefs a single word can express that can transform our lives. Of course, we all know that such a single word does not exist, just as we know that success is never a single act, but rather a combination of factors, experiences, and decisions. But if I were held to only one word that I believe is the most important for us to have ingrained in our everyday lives and thoughts, it would be the word truth. Um, to their teammates, for themselves, their role and their improvement, to the organization, for the results, both good and bad, and for carrying out and policing the culture of accountability. Um, so, um, I, you know, a lot of the, I, I've had to, like such a rough basketball season because my favorite player has not been good. Uh, and I'm not going to say he has been good, but I think it's been really hard to see him um, not in the rotation. Um, like, And I think this is part of the reason I sort of had a breakthrough when I was reading about this is, is I think they challenged him to, to do more than he could make happen. Like he, early in the year, they were having him guard like, um, forwards and, um, you know, and it just, it, the, the outcome was statistically not good. Right. Um, and some of that's luck, uh, you know, for sure. And some of it's sample size, uh, and some of it's like the lack of having, um, you know, long form developmental min minutes in an actual game. You know, but this is kind of the the beauty and the pain of basketball is like some guys get these chances and all the chances come in a totally weird and different form. Like you might get a chance to be on a bad team and play a bunch of freaking minutes and figure a bunch of stuff out. You might be on a good team and fit perfectly and you might not. Right. So um, but hearing the truth about how you can be better, what you need to improve on, why you're in or out of the lineup, I think is pretty vital um, from, you know, from your teammates, from uh, your coaches, um, and from the organization. Um, and it, it's, it's the only thing that will allow you to overcome that, you know, uncomfortable truths, let's say. Um, is, is knowing them. Um, and I think so often in our society, either we don't have close enough relationships, you know, like, I mean, in my family, for instance, like it, you, there's no choice. You just tell the truth. That's all there is that, it, that you understand that they, it won't, it doesn't impact the way that you feel about each other in any way whatsoever. You just trust those people implicitly to, give you the down and dirty on everything right um and how i think some best friends are like that too where it's like no you're not being honest with yourself or you're not seeing something or and these are probably pivotal for you know the biggest growth that we do in our lives so um and then i i think the one thing that i sort of got stuck on here is this culture of accountability 
And uh, one of the things that's really bothered me about the King's performances is not, uh, not as much the performances, like the performances mostly that are like funky or bad. Like I said, I can like go to a certain point in the game and be like, wow, they really lost their shit right there. Like they, they lost focus. I let the refs get to them. They couldn't get it back on drop, whatever they, they, you know, they completely biffed it on rebounds or turnovers or free throws or very specific things that they can change and do differently. Right. But for me, one of the issues has been that in, in several of these blowouts, uh, I think to the Pelicans, it might've been the Pelicans twice. They sent Keon Ellis out to the podium to talk about the game. And I think the reason why they did it is that he was the best player in those games, but he played in garbage time when the rest of the team weren't cutting it, you know? Um, and that, that's not always true. He played, he played in really valuable minutes too. I'm not trying, but he's not even on their freaking payroll. He is a two way player. His payroll is with the Stockton Kings. He's making, you know, less than 10% of some of these guys salary. And it just bugs the shit out of me that they put him out there to be accountable for these kind of gross performances. Again, I understand that the motivation could be that he had the best performance, but the reporters are not going to sit there and ask him about his performance. Um, I mean, credit to a lot of those post games that the reporters have also understood that it's not, it's not his responsibility that they blew the game out. Right. But anyways, I find that to be sort of concerning about the culture of accountability at the, that the Kings have at the moment. Um, so whether we experience failure or success as a team or personally, we have to move on to the next thing. So um, success has many tests and one of them is failure. Can you learn and move on from failure? So like I said, I think there's like, you know, different timelines where you can talk about this. Like, did you just get fouled? Like, that's one of my, you know, pet peeves watching basketball is these like constant freaking arguing with the refs. It's like, they're not going to change their mind. You're derailing the entire game. Um, I'm and I'm not defending refs. Sometimes they should also be held accountable. Um, and I don't exactly know who does that, but for especially end of the game, like I think the officiating has been wretched in a lot of the games I've watched um, as far as completely junking up the entire um, flow of the game. And, um, I think officiating, I would probably say like this season to me has been the worst season I've seen. And I'm not talking about in terms of the Kings, actually, I'm just talking about league wide, all the games I've watched, it seems extremely, um, partial to certain stars. Um, and then, you know, impartial to other stars. Um, but anyways, I, to get back to, to what I was just saying is, is this kind of thought of like move on in the moment and then move on afterwards at all. However, like I think there's, you know, again, like you can be like, oh, I don't think about it, whatever. I, you know, bad game. Okay. But what are you taking away from it? You have to take something away from it, right? You need to be able to learn from your failure as well as, you know, it's not just like, a, oh, okay, no problem. Like we play again tomorrow. Like, no, like why did this go so far off the rails? You know, what exact, uh, you know, things can you do? And I'm not even talking about, I think a lot of people too, there's like this whole, oh, well, you got to practice free throws more. Like, no, free throws are a fucking graft, right? Some people are great at them. Some people are terrible at them. Some people are good at them sometimes, whatever, like, um, you know, I, I go back to, um, how to watch basketball, like a genius where they talk about, or the Tyrese Halliburton, Paul, uh, P Paul George podcast, where they talk about how free throws, game time free throws are so different than practicing free throws. I mean, you have tired legs, the crowd noise, it's not, there's like this depth perception element of the crowd behind you that isn't there when you're just practicing them in a gym. 
you know, there's just so many factors, but it's like, I do think you can say, look, we have to win by, we have to be winning by more than whatever free throws we're going to get, whatever foul calls we're randomly going to get, you know, thrown our way. Like we have to be winning by more than that. You know, we can't just let everything go down to the wire and then procrastinate out a win, you know, and expect to get it on a free throw. Like that's just dumb. Um, and then let me see here. Basketball is not a game of perfect, nor is coaching or leadership. We have to be able to adjust, but I caution you here. We should not adjust after every time something doesn't work because if we believe in everything we believe in nothing um so that one also like hit home for me like i feel like the the, the king's offense this year has been a massive over adjustment i think um like they've tried to change a lot of stuff and push a lot of um defensive acumen as far as like we've definitely seen like i i feel like um De'Aaron, keegan um sasha um although he wasn't on the team last year um and malik have all tried to be the best defender on the floor when they're on the floor but that makes it really hard to be the best offense as well right so there's some mix that's missing there but i also feel like they over reacted to De'Aaron's I, I feel like you could look at our playoff run and and be like okay you know what elements can we switch out here to me um there was like a certain player I would have switched um and then also um De'Aaron broke his finger like um, I, I think you have to like say, okay, part of that was luck and it was bad luck and what we're doing would have worked without that bad luck. Or at least we think that there was like a high probability that it would have worked. Right. Um, so I don't know. And maybe, you know, maybe I'll be proven wrong and I hope that I am. And that these kind of like things that they've tried to implement and like incorporate, will start paying dividends later in the season. I definitely have seen, like I said, the difference. And like, I think Keegan p can be a great defender, but I, they need another element, especially if they're going to sit Davion, who again, his like advanced analytics for this year defensively are, are not good. Um, but he's extremely disruptive and he, um, I mean, it's a, it's like so mind boggling, like how, did it disappear right because he was he, he was so good at like point of attack ball pressure defense um and it just hasn't been the same this year uh, there's been a couple times that it's been i think it's been revelatory but but not like it was so anyways um so don't be overreactive but adjust right um and then Pat Riley, one of the greatest coaches of all time, had a saying that gets to the heart of how human nature can affect a team. He called it the disease of me, worrying about me first, protecting my brand, making sure I get my recognition. In essence, it's creating a personal agenda versus a team first agenda. So that's sort of like where this kind of concept of like, I'm going to get mine, I mean, very much see it like i saw it early in the wizard season but like now i don't i almost just see like absolute i don't know i don't know what i see in the wizards anymore they're so bad i just see like that they kind of gave up on on everything um alvin gentry many years ago had a an interview that i listened to even before he was the coach of um the kings he had an interview where they they talked a lot about him, you know, working with Pop, and they talked about his the Clippers team, the 2001, I think it was Clippers team, um, that was so good, but that they they fell apart at the end of the year because he was saying like everybody started getting like towards the end of the year, like they were so fun, and for the first time the Clippers had like a lot of eyes on them, and people they were kind of a more fun 
you know, watch than the Lakers and because they were something different. They were young. They were bouncy. They had the knuckleheads, like all the stuff. But he said towards the end of it, like, like Lamar got an offer from the Heat, I think. Like people's contracts came up and like all of this disease of me stuff started cropping up and becoming an issue, um, you know, about what, how much money am I going to get? I think like salary can maybe get this way too. Like how am I going to get paid? Where's my bag, you know, um, kind of thing too, so. Uh, so often today we fight the demands, the to-do list, the time, I think I've already read this one, um, but this is the overwhelm, right? The time constraints, the pressure from our bosses, the projects at home, the clutter that fills our minds, and of course, the everyday pressure to produce. The demands seem nonstop. They smother us and cause mental paralysis. We can never seem to catch up, let alone get ahead. Simply put, such demands trap us in a life of frustration, angst, and mental fatigue rather than one of daily concentration on how we can improve, grow, and love the life we are living. So his answer to that um, was uh, to prioritize, make good um, priority lists, uh, and again, like make time for those things that are extremely important. Um, and I had, I didn't put this on my thing here. Let's see if it comes up any better. Okay. So the iceberg principle comes into play here. The phenomenon we are all familiar with that only about 10% of an iceberg's mass is visible above the water. The strength of the iceberg is underneath the surface unseen. Preparation is the unseen grind that produces the biggest plays under the brightest lights. Like an iceberg, the depth of your preparation is where your strength will come as you tackle challenges. So ironically, like, I mean, um, you know, I think Davion's uh, like motto is trust your work, which hasn't worked out that great this year, but um, it's sort of, it, it, it goes along with the same kind of concept, right? Is, is that, the preparation and the closing of the gaps and your belief in yourself are what can carry you through to breakthroughs to, um, uh, you know, to a higher trajectory and all of this stuff. So anyways, I, I enjoyed this book. I thought it was really good. I really didn't know what to expect from it, which I think a lot of the times has made these books better for me is that it's like a surprise. Um, and then I think um, I, our next book, I believe, is going to be uh, Breaking Through, which I've run it, wanted to read for a while, which is the story about the secret game um, and uh, the young black um, coach that studied under Naismith that basically invented like the fast breaking game and they played against um, I want to say Yale, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Um, anyway, so we'll be breaking through and I will publish the date. I don't have a good calendar to look at in here. Let me see if I can pull one up. Um, but in a month or two, I will, even if I do it by myself, I'll come back and do one more. If I'm going to do the podcast all by myself every time, I might quit it. I just wanted to learn how to do a podcast. Um, and so that's been fun. I've enjoyed it. Um, but if I have other people, I continue it. Um, and I think the discussion, you know, I can make all these notes and read all these quotes, but it's, it's not like having a discussion about the material that I think really corrects, you know, what I'm misunderstanding. Um, and or like shining light on different parts that weren't relevant for me. So anyways, um, thank you so much for your support and have a great month.